Gospel of John, chapter 1. We've been in John for the past 63 or so weeks, and, or 64 weeks. And, uh, but as we consider Christmas particularly, I'd like us just to return to uh, John chapter 1. And there are a few things there I'd like us to consider, and we'll also move to uh, various other parts of the Bible too. But let's just uh, pause for a moment of prayer, shall we? Let's just commit our time uh, to the Lord as we look into His Word. Let us pray. We're thankful, Father, that we can be found in your presence. We're able to uh, take your word and open it. We can put, as it were, our feet under your table and look to you expectantly, Lord, that you'd speak to us and feed us from the word of God. We pray, Lord, that, uh, as always, Lord, that you'd open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of this star, Lord. And particularly, Lord, at this Christmas time, as we consider afresh the birth of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand and appreciate all that that meant. So, Father, do have your hand of blessing upon us now, we do pray. And we'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, there was a song called, uh, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. And I'm not going to wax lyrical now. I'm not going to sing that song to you. I don't think it's really a Christian song, actually. But um, I suppose for the most part, people think of it as being the most wonderful time of the year because Christmas means a great deal of different things to different people. So to, some, to a child, for instance, Christmas is all about the presents. To uh, you and I, as we perhaps get older, the time that we can spend with our family and our loved ones, so we, we, we kind of meet up with people that we haven't seen for a long time. Uh, that, that can be really, uh, you know, a, a wonderful time of the year. And I'm sure you're also looking forward to the wonderful Christmas meal that you're going to have on Tuesday morning as well. So if I was to ask you why is it a wonderful time of the year, I'm sure we'd have quite a few varied opinions as to why it is indeed a wonderful time. But I want to set aside the frivolous things as to why it is a wonderful time of the year. And I want you to consider... A, this morning afresh the Lord Jesus Christ and consider afresh in all that he has done for us and that he stepped off his throne and came into this world uh, and he came for the express purpose of reconciling you and I to a holy God. So I have four things this morning that I'd like to share with you from the word of God as to why Christmas is wonderful. Firstly I'll say to you this morning that Christmas is wonderful when you consider who he is. Look, if you would, with me in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and we'll read the first four verses, and then we'll go to verse 14. Verse 1 of chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And verse 14 goes on to say, And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. These are verses that we've, I'm sure, read quite a number of times, but you know, these are verses in the Bible that lay out a number of very important truths to us. In fact, the truths that we've just read are essential. They are at the core of Christianity. Because these verses declare unto us the deity, and it declares unto us the omnipotence of our Lord and of our Saviour. Now, there are some things I'll give to you this morning that when we think about Christ and we consider all that he is, that he is God in the flesh, you know, there are some things that I think that are too difficult for us to fully uh, comprehend. Uh, for us to fully understand the doctrine of the Trinity, I think is an impossibility. But it's one of those things that we, we just take and lay hold of by faith. I know it to be true because the word of God declares it to be true. So we think about the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and we think as to why Christmas is wonderful because of who he is. 
And, and I would just remind you of this. I know you know this, but I want to remind you of this. That he is the eternal son of God. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. So this is a very important phrase. This verse in the Bible tells us and speaks of the pre-existence of the Son of God. God the Son always was. There never was a time when God the Son was not. It is wrong for us to think when we think of Bethlehem and we think of the Saviour being born, of Jesus being born, and think, well, this is where the Son had his beginning. He didn't become the Son at Bethlehem. He always was the Son. Jesus, the man, you could say, had his beginning there, but God, the Son, is from eternity past. This is a, a tremendous truth in the Word of God. He always was. The Bible says in the book of Micah, and chapter 5 and verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. And then notice this phrase, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So the babe that was born in that manger, the Bible says, his goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. This is difficult for us to comprehend. We, we have a difficulty understanding because we live in the realm of time. We, we find it difficult to comprehend something that lives outside of time. But think about the Lord Jesus Christ, think about God the Son, and understand this, that there never was a time when He was not. So I say to you this morning that the Bible very clearly teaches us that we serve a, a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Bible clearly tells us that these three also uh, are one. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, the Bible says that there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And oftentimes when people ask you about the Trinity, this is one of our kind of go-to verses but the fact of the matter is when you read the Bible you can see that from the Old Testament right through to the New and particularly in the New Testament you can see the, the fact that we serve a triune God in particular God the Son did not have a beginning he was not created as some people may suggest he wasn't created in the virgin womb of Mary and he didn't become the Christ as he lived upon the earth and died upon the cross. He always was. Paul said this in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. He said, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest. In the flesh and this is a great mystery It's difficult isn't it for us to get our minds around that God the one who inhabits eternity clothed himself with human flesh Jesus would say to the Jews in John chapter 8 Jesus said unto them verily verily I say unto you before Abraham was I am and when he said that, the Jews knew exactly what he was saying. He's saying, I am that I am. I am the self-existent God who reveals himself. 
And in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, we read Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So these are tremendous truths to think of the fact that he is eternal. But not only is he eternal, I like you to notice that he is the creator of God as well. It's very interesting when you see how, some, how, how so similar some passages of the Bible are. So we read, for instance, in, in our text, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This seems to be a, a phrase that John likes because he writes in his epistle, 1 John chapter 1, he says, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it to bear witness, and show unto that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Same that was in the beginning. And then you're mindful of the fact that the very first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning, God, created the heavens and the earth. Look, if you would, in the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1, and we'll read from verse 12 down to verse 17. <coughs> Colossians, chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. For by him, so this is by Jesus, by the Son of God, by him, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And then the next verse goes on to say that he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. It's wonderful when you consider who he is. Hebrews, as you begin in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, tells us the same thing. Hebrews 1 and verse, 1 and verse 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So we think of the Christ at Christmas. We think of the, the babe in the manger, but let's never lose sight of just who he is. It's the most wonderful time of the year when you consider who he is. There's a song called The Wonder of Wonders. I believe a group by the inspiration sang this a long time ago. It's a very old song that's been around for, for a long time. I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to share with you a few of the words. The Wonder of Wonders as she looked on his face, obviously speaking of Mary, that this little boy spoke the worlds in their place. The stars and the moon shining brightly on them, the earth and the sun were created by him. You know, there were people, it's always been like this, but there were people in Mary's day where people didn't believe that Jesus was God. 
Well, let me tell you, with Mary, there was no doubt in her mind that what she held, that little babe that she brought into this world, there was no doubt that this was the Son of God. You know, when it was told to Mary that she would conceive and in her womb and she would bring forth a son and they would call him Jesus, her response was, well, how can this be? Uh, uh, this is an impossibility. I know not a man. I've never been with another man. This is a total impossibility. But no, the angel impressed upon her that he would be great and he, God would give unto him the throne of his father, David. He shall reign over the house of David or Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. How can this be? But then the angel would say unto Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Wherefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So, even if everyone in the world doubted who Jesus was, Mary knew. She was fully convinced. And you can well imagine, and I'm sure you know both mothers do this, I guess dads do as well, when your baby's born, you count in fingers and you count in toes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You want to make sure that they're all together there. And I wonder if, if as Jesus was held by his mother, Mary, and she counts those little fingers, that she's thinking to herself, this is the one that threw the stars into space. If she's thinking, this is the one who years ago, when God met with Moses on the Mount of Sinai, that would take those tablets and write out the very law of God. She knew that this was a son like no other. That song, The Wonder of Wonders, goes on to say, the wonder of wonders as she heard his small cry that this voice had thundered on Mount Sinai. The hand that she held so tenderly hath made a dry path through the mighty Red Sea. Yes, Christmas is certainly a most wonderful time when you consider just who Jesus is. And then it's a wonderful time because when you consider as to where he left, we know that he, throughout eternity, has been in the presence of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Throughout eternity, they enjoyed a sweet communion. Even when God created this world and created man, formed man, you know, God said, who is he saying this to? God the Father said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Who's he talking to? He's talking to God the Son. He's talking to God the Holy Spirit. He had enjoyed unbroken, sweet fellowship. He sat upon the throne. There was an angelic chorus that worshipped before him all of the time. You know, when we think of heaven... We think as to how it applies to us, and I guess we would want to know more about our future heavenly home. So we think about the streets of gold, we think about the walls of jasper, we, we, we consider all these things, the reunion that we'll have with saints that we have gone on before. But to think of heaven from his perspective, this was his heavenly home. This is where he has always been. But he stepped off that throne. And he came into this world. It's wonderful, isn't it? When you think as to not just who he is, but where he came from. Then thirdly, I'd like you to notice, not only is it wonderful when you think as to where he left, but I think it's wonderful when you consider as to who and what he became. 
Look, if you would, in Philippians in chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and we read from verse 5 to verse 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And this speaks about the fact as to how Jesus became a man. So one of the phrases that is used in connection with this is the, the Greek word kenosis. And it speaks about an emptying of himself. It's actually one of those concepts that can very easily go into um, false teaching or it can help us to understand exactly what had happened. You see, when Jesus clothed himself with mankind became a man it would be wrong to say that he emptied himself of his deity that he is stopped or he ceased being God that is where the doctrine of the kenosis would go horribly wrong to believe that this emptying of himself would have to deal with becoming less than God now, I think this matter of the kenosis or this matter of this emptying of himself really has to do with the fact that he was setting aside the glory that he had as God. That he was setting aside some of the divine... And again, I recognize that easily, I could misspeak, but, and I don't mean to in any way take away from Jesus, but how he would set aside some of his divine prerogatives as God. Because he humbled himself. He became like you and I. But he didn't stop being God. He, he still remained God in the flesh. And so this matter of his humiliation. He took upon this humble form of a man. He set aside any independent uh, thinking. He was always subject to the will of God the Father. And he limited himself. Now think about this. God, who is limitless, limits himself to the bounds of a human nature. You know, when he would ride into Jerusalem, he would send, on the day of on his triumphal entry, he would send his disciples, go get me that donkey, get me the ass there, and say to the man, the Lord hath need of him. Now that's remarkable, that the Lord would have need of anything. But as a man... He humbled himself and said, I need that. And time and again, we see as to how he allowed himself to be limits and to live under the bounds of frail humanity. The paradox, I suppose, of our Lord's life was, is summed up in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, where the Bible says that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So the Creator became this helpless infant, dependent upon his mother for everything. He owned all things, but possessed nothing. He had flung the stars into space, but the Bible says of Jesus that the Son of Man had not where to lay his head. He had formed every drop of water upon this earth, and yet the same one said, I thirst. He hungered. He was a weary. 
he humbled himself and became as a man. Indeed, he became a man in every respect, with one exception, in that he was a sinless man. But in every other respect, he identified himself fully to us. And he did this for a number of reasons. One of the things is so that he could be a sympathetic high priest. Those trials that you and I are going through, those difficult times, he knows all about it because he went through those times as well. He's able to sympathize and be sympathetic with you when you're going through that difficult time. One of the things that we looked at last week and when we concluded the Gospel of John is we were considering the miracles are recorded. So we... We mentioned there's a number of series of sevens in the book of John. But there are only seven miracles that John records for us. And, and there are some 39 miracles that the Bible records for us, you know, throughout. You know what's amazing to me? Is it, the, the thing that's amazing isn't just that John only recorded seven or that there are 39 miracles performed, supernatural events, supernatural things taking place. I'm amazed that that's all that he did. You know, the Bible says that he grew up as a carpenter. He would have learned his trade from, from Joseph. His, you know, people considered him to be his father, but he was really just, you know, someone that was looking after God and entrusted Jesus to him. But he had learned his trade from Joseph. He would have to go out and cut trees down. And in his workshop, he would be, you know, making farm implements. He would, he would be making, it was a heavy, toilsome type of work. And even if he made beds and chairs, but I suspect it was more of the bigger things, farm in instruments, that he would have made. He would have had blisters on his hands. He would have wiped the sweat from his brow. But being God, he could have said, cloud, be formed. He could, he could have said, cart, and there it was. But no, he didn't. It would have been totally within his power to do that. But as a man, he humbled himself, and he wearied, and he toiled in making all of these things. Isn't it a wonderful thing? When you consider who he is, where he left, what he became, these things are just too wonderful for us. But then last of this morning, I would say to you that he, it is wonderful when you consider who he came for. Turn with me if you would once again to John's Gospel, chapter 1. And we'll read from verse 10 to verse 14. John chapter 1 verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The wonder is that he would come to this earth for a people such as you and I. Isn't it something that is difficult to get your mind around? There's a wonder when you consider who he is, where he came from, what he became. But the wonder of wonders is that he would come to a people such as us. A people that go through their life in rebellion towards God, shaking their fists towards heaven. Why, God? 
Have you allowed this to happen? Why, God, have you uh, formed me thus? This is the kind of people that Jesus Christ came for. He, he took him upon himself the form of a man, and he robed himself with human flesh, and he came for you and I. So consider, if you would, the enormity of this. The sinless one became, came to this earth so that he could bear the sins of the world. The innocent one came to this world so that he could be declared guilty by wicked men. The eternal one came into this world and allowed himself to be directed by time. The supernatural God came to dwell amongst the natural creation. 2 Corinthians says this in chapter 5 and verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is why he came. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the, the second person of the Godhead, would come down into this world and he would clothe himself with human flesh, he would live a sinless life. He would live a life where he is just but a blessing to everyone that he meets. But that's not the only reason why he would come. He came into this world so that he would be taken and delivered up to cruel and wicked men. And they would crucify him. And the sinless, spotless Lamb of God would become sin. For the sins of the world. He came to this world so that we could be reconciled to God. Somebody said it like this, that the Son of God became the Son of Man. So that the sons of men could become the sons of God. He came, this is the marvel, that he would come for you and I. That song that I was quoting a bit earlier, The Wonder of Wonders, it goes on to say, in the last couple of stanzas, it says, The wonder of wonders, as the Father looked on, in eternity past, this was his Son. God sent him to die on Calvary's tree, and that is the wonder of wonders to me. The wonder of wonders, oh, how could it be? That God became flesh and was given for me. The Almighty came down and walked among men. The wonder of wonders. He died for my sin. This Christmas time, may this be a time where it is indeed the most wonderful time of the year. But let it not be the gifts under the tree the family gathered around the table, or indeed the meal on the table. May this wonderful time of the year be just that, because of who Jesus is. It is most wonderful when you consider who he is, where he came from, what he became, and who he came for. I pray this morning that if you're a believer, that this would just thrill your heart. That God would love me so. That Jesus would love me so. That he would come into this world and make the way possible so I could be saved. And if you do not know Jesus as your Savior today, I pray that today the light of the gospel would shine into your heart and in your soul. And you'd recognize this is the real meaning of Christmas. This is what makes Christmas wonderful. That he would come. And that he would come for me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the lessons that we see and learn from it. We just pray that you'd help us, Lord, as believers, to appreciate this great 